Hi, I hope you're having a great week. Here we are Wednesday night. It's my midweek Bible study with Bishop Ed. Hey, I'm glad to come to you again this week and continue the study and the look at living victoriously, even over our emotions. Um, you know, a lot of people are living in fear. Anxiety seems to be at a very high level. What's called mental illness or mental disease seems to be rampant. I'm a little concerned, though, that we call everything that we feel a mental illness. <laughs> that is uh, probably an overkill of diagnosis in our time. And it's not to make light of anybody that's struggling with serious mental conditions. But I want to give you hope that even the most serious of mental conditions are subject to the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus still heals and saves. If he can heal cancer, he can heal depression. If he can heal diabetes and open blind eyes, as I've recently seen again in Crusade, just recently in the Philippines, then I know he can heal you of anxiety attacks. There's nothing too difficult for him and nothing that is above his name. Having said that, I want to get in tonight to some further study concerning um, the makeup of the human being, how God made us and how he made us to work or operate. Everything on earth has a function. Everything created by God has a divine purpose and a way that it is designed to operate at its optimum. Sin has come into the human condition and has diminished our understanding and our ability to know how our spiritual side is set to operate in our lives. So I want to continue that. If you look at last week's teaching, it's available on all of our Victorious Living pages, uh, as well as YouTube. If you if you watch that, you'll get a basis for this teaching tonight. We're going to be in the Bible for quite a bit for the next 30 minutes and uh, take some time to get you a Bible, get you some notepad here as I get ready to dive right into it in just a moment. Had some very disturbing um, poll numbers come out by a Christian pollster named George Barna. You may or may not have heard of him. Uh, his primary business is to poll uh, and take different polls of the condition of the church in the world and mostly in America. Recent poll says that only 37% of senior pastors who lead churches have a biblical worldview. I'm not real sure uh, what all those other pastors are believing in, but um, only 37% in this particular poll claim to have a biblical worldview. It's no wonder our churches are in trouble if the pastors are looking to other means to lead their congregations. And it gets a little more and more dismal as you head down the, uh, the ladder, so to speak, and you come into children's pastoring and youth pastoring, we see even lower numbers of people with biblical worldview leading our children, uh, supposedly in discipleship. This is a problem, and it's a problem born out of uh, a low view of Bible of the scriptures, a low view of the Bible. I have a very high view of this Bible. This is the infallible, inspired word of the living God. And every word in it is divinely placed and predetermined by God that would come to us that we might live by it, that we might know Him through it. To me, there is no reason, simply no reason to even have church to have a church, to call yourself a pastor, if this book isn't what you're using for a basis of life and your faith. Why, what, what, is, what sense is there then? Just become a motivational speaker, motivational club, social club, whatever you want to be, but don't call yourself a Christian church if you can't adhere to the very document that God himself gave us. So having said that, it segues into my teaching. So I believe a lot of people have fear and anxiety today. It's, it's alarming. It's, it's almost off the charts. And many, many people have been diagnosed with all kinds of mental illnesses. We call every feeling we have that's negative uh, a potential mental illness. And I don't want to make any light of people that have real struggles uh, with mental illness where their brain is not functioning properly by brain damage or other problems that has caused the brain 
through maybe a lot of use of drugs, uh, alcohol has caused the brain to become less functional. It is through our natural brain that we process many of our soul and spirit uh, thoughts, um, will, and emotions. And so when that becomes damaged, it does influence just like anything else in our life. It can influence and impede function. I think it's very dangerous, though, that we call every feeling of downness or uh, melancholy or the blues or we have a bad day that we all of a sudden start being maybe I'm bipolar. Maybe I have a diagnosable disease that now will give me medication to fix it. I'm not here to talk about medication tonight. Uh, I'm not going to make suggestions about medication. That's between you, your doctor and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What I am going to talk about is how I believe we can have victory over area, every arena and area of our life, including the emotional one. I talked a little bit about this Sunday morning. I really need to probably develop a curriculum and have a class about this. And I'm working on that. I'm trying to work on a lot of different pieces and parts right now of my teachings so that we can put them in a better place for everyone. But suffice it to say that there is a process There is a biblical process and principle to you walking in victory even over your emotions. God created our emotional side. The emotions that we carry and we exhibit and we feel are part of the makeup of who God made us to be. They're part of what connects us to the world, to each other, and to Him. They're how we process Highs and lows of life's events around us. I understand what emotions are about. But if all I think about myself is how I feel, then I'm going to miss the opportunity to really grow in spiritual maturity, in natural maturity, and I'm going to inhibit my ability to not only cope, but conquer the more difficult parts of my life that I might face. Um, God gives us emotions. We'll see that in Scripture. But He also gives us a will, and He gives us thoughts. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. I think it's important. But I want you to know you do not have to live defeated in this area. You do not have to accept a diagnosis that's been given you as a lifelong prison sentence to fear and anxiety, depression, uh, bipolarism, Uh, multi-personality disorders, whatever you may have been tagged with, ADHD, ADD, whatever it might be. And this this is so, it's become so controversial even to mention these things in connection with the idea that you can have victory over them. The pushback I always get is you're going to put people in a dangerous position because they're going to think they can get off, get out of this. They can get victory and then they're going to get themselves in a worse condition that's your opinion and it's possible but not if jesus is involved and not if faith is involved it's no more uh false hope than to me look at a cancer person pray for them a tumor and say god is going to heal you And then when the healing comes, be afraid that cancer might come back. Doesn't stop me from praying for that healing. Now, knowing that even maybe another disease could come upon this person. We live in the moment. We live now. But we also have a consideration of what might be coming. But at the same time, we don't pray for people who are sick mentally or physically just out of compassion for them. Or because we want to prove a point that we can bring healing. We pray about these things because this is the covenant that the Lord Jesus Christ made with Father God at Calvary. When he died on the cross, his blood procured the forgiveness of our sins and the brokenness of his body brought covenant of healing to our natural bodies. That means mentally and physically. So I want to talk about that tonight. All right. So you don't have to agree with it. You can turn me off right now. You can even send me a nasty letter about it or a note. But I'm going to tell you, I'll never back off the idea that you can walk in victory even over the emotional problems in life. That your emotions do not have to drive your life into the ground. But you can have victory over it and live in joy and live in peace 
and live with hope no matter what you face no matter how much loss you face no matter how much trauma you go through there is a god who sustains a god who heals and a god who provides and that's the god i'm going to talk about all right let's start with first thessalonians 5 23 because that's where we started last time and uh first thessalonians 5 23 will give us the actual cadence or menace mentioning of the three-part nature of the human being first thessalonians 5 23 uh, says now may the god of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ may your whole spirit your whole soul and your whole body three parts be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ he who calls you is faithful verse 24 and also will do it all right so there's three parts to us i again delved with this a little bit on sunday if you listen to the message we are spirit beings who possess a soul who live in a body the spiritual part of us is the divine spark. It is the divine, eternal part of us that animates life, but also goes beyond the realm of this natural world into the heavenly realm, which is invisible to us, but real. Matter of fact, let's say this, that the invisible but real spiritual uh, dimension or sphere or world precedes precludes and is more powerful than the natural world the very metal this is made out of the chair i'm sitting in the wood of my desk the wood of these shells behind me all came from things of the earth everything the earth has came about because god from the spirit realm spoke it into existence so the spirit realm, supernatural, it supersedes, precedes, supersedes everything that is natural. So principle number one that you can write down is the spiritual is supernatural. Not supernatural in the sense of ghosts and all of the Hollywood versions that we see, but supernatural in that it supersedes, it is supreme to everything in the natural. The Bible says that God upholds all things by the word of his power. We even know from science that there is a God particle they're looking for. They have these billion, multi-trillion dollar uh, accelerators where they collide atoms and they try to find this piece of material that's holding the very basis of foundation of everything that exists, of all matter together. And so far, it's still an invisible space. But even if they find some kind of matter that's invisible to us, that matter still came from God. But it also would tell us if they never see it, and it's an energy, it's a force that is unseeable by human beings, it would help us understand it more if we understood the scripture that says he upholds all things. He holds all things together by the word of his power. So when God said, let there be, that became the glue to all things that exist. The atom and all of the pieces of the atom that swirl around even in my body right here are held together by the power of God. All things exist in Him and through Him and by Him, the Scripture says. So I'm spirit, soul, and body. This is the way I've been constructed. My spirit man is the eternal part of me that comes from God. I call it the divine intention. As mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. What did he know about Jeremiah? That he would be a prophet to the nations. It was a divine purpose and a divine intention that brought him into existence. And he came to be as an embryo in his mother's womb and grew into a uh, human being that was born. But before he entered that womb, God knew him. Didn't say God knew about him. But God knew him. All of us come from that place of God's mind. This is why we all have divine purpose. This is why abortion is so egregious to God. Because we have 
a divine intention. So you and I uh, also have divine purpose. I have a spirit. I am a spirit man. But I have a soul. So to get my to function in the realm of knowledge and reasoning and wisdom and uh, to carry out the divine purpose that God has, he had to give me a mechanism. He had to give me a way, sort of an internal computer, I guess, is a good way to look at it. And so he gave me a spirit. So I'm a soul. I'm a spirit. He gave me a soul. I'm sorry. I'm a spirit who he gave a soul to. He attached the two together in, in this realm of the spirit. It's the part of us that when we die goes on to heaven. It's the part of us. It's the part right now that's talking to you. My, my lips are moving, which are natural. My eyes are looking at you. Your ears are hearing me. But the part that's receiving, that is processing, the part that's speaking to you is the spirit and soul of Ed Akers, not the body. When the spirit and soul fly away into heaven, as we use the term fly away, when it goes to that new realm, that higher place, is what thus why we say fly, when it goes to that higher dimension, this body will just be inanimate. Nothing you do will help. It will not talk. <laughs> I've been over many caskets. Bodies do not talk when that soul leaves. So the soul then, what is it? The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions, or thoughts, volition, or decision-making, and finally, emotions or feelings. These three parts we call the heart, the very core of us, is combined together to make what the Bible calls the heart of man or the soul. This is our personality, our essence. It's our potential. It's our, it's our driving engine as we come to this earth. Then we have a body, obviously, and the body helps me interact on this natural world. Obviously, without a body, I couldn't talk to you. My soul would not be able to talk to you because on this earth, in this natural world, God has made everything to operate through a body. So this is the biblical worldview, as I'm talking earlier, that pastors need to have biblical worldviews. I did not come from an amoeba in the water billions of years ago. It wasn't a happenstance clash of two cells that became four cells, it became eight cells, it became 16 cells. It didn't come from a fish that grew some legs over a period of billions and billions of years and developed intellect. Uh, somehow one generation started to go, hmm, well, now we can stand a little bit, or now we can talk. And the way that uh, evolutionists and uh, those talk about this, they have to add billions of years at such a small rate of change to make it possible because there are no demonstrable changes in the human being or any other animal or plant or anything else on its own that can demonstrate us changing from one species or kind to another. There's not even really any known fossil records that show a change in process. So they've crafted a fantasy, in my opinion, of billions of years. And Christians are intimidated by this because it's science. And it sounds like there's lots of good evidence in their arguments. But the Bible's very clear that God made man and woman in the image of God. We did not de ascend from a lower level uh, type of being. We are and always have been human beings and will continue to be. And we are spirit. We are spirits who have souls who walk around in bodies. Before you're born again, the spirit man is dead in trespasses and sin because we are born in iniquity because of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. So the average person who does not know Jesus Christ, all of us, until we know Jesus Christ, we are operating on two of three cylinders. We're a three-cylinder engine that's operating on two cylinders. The first cylinder we're operating on is our body, the natural world. Children, when they're born as babies, they react to their natural world. They cry when their bottom's wet from the wet diaper. When their belly is rolling for hunger, they scream out. 
When pain hits them or you tickle them, they giggle. Everything is responsive to the natural world. As they begin to get old enough to communicate and old enough to understand and the, the soul starts to develop within the person as the body begins to age, then comes personality. Then comes will. And man, if you've ever had a two-year-old, you know the will of human beings is one of the most strong th strongest things on the earth. And so that will is strong and many times has to be trained, has to be nurtured, has to be taught, sometimes even almost has to be broken if it's going in the wrong direction. Then we begin to really respond in our feelings. And because our spirit man is deadened in a coma, coma state, because we don't have Jesus in us yet, we've not asked for, for the forgiveness of our sins, we've not repented, and the Spirit of God's not been endued upon us, we operate predominantly by our reasoning capacity, but mainly by our feelings. And so we see preteen and teen feelings, and, and we know what those are like. And then as the hormones in the body kind of add to that, it becomes even more intense, and we see these reactions. Once we become born again, and we give our life to Christ, the Lord speaks to our soul and our mind and and uh, the, through the Holy Spirit and the grace of God and the pulling of, of the power of God and the Word of God, where it reveals to us the need for our spirit to come to life. And there's something missing in us. My thoughts aren't satisfying. My feelings aren't satisfying. No matter how much I eat, I'm not satisfied. No matter how many things I own, I'm not satisfied. Because the body is insatiable. Hunger will come again this afternoon. Our thoughts are the same way. There's no satisfying conclusion to most of our thoughts apart from God. Why am I here? How did I get here? Where am I going? What's my purpose? And we try to find these things in our reasoning and our feelings. But our reasoning and our feelings always come to a dead-end wall. Because there seems to be no higher purpose than just... Well, I felt good about that. But a lot of things in life we don't feel good about. We do things that we regret. We have negative feelings. We have grief when we lose people. Uh, I wouldn't call them negative feelings. They're just down feelings. You know, we, we, we want to we skew all, reject all bad feelings. But feelings, good and bad, are given to us by the Lord. The key is our spirit man has to come to life. This is essential to understanding how the spirit and the body are supposed to operate together. Once we say yes to Christ and we pray the prayer of salvation and we pray in the name of Jesus and we repent from our sins and make a decision. Somebody once said salvation doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't, we can't buy our salvation is the way I would put it, but it costs you your will. You have to decide, I need God. I need to give up my old life, and I need to follow him. It is a decision. In Deuteronomy chapter uh, 30, verse 15 through 19, the Lord says to the children of Israel, I set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. Choose this day. Choose blessing. Joshua looked at the people and said, Choose this day who you will serve, whether Baal, serve him, whether the Lord, serve him. But if he be God, serve him. As for me and my house, we will, the word will, choose decide use our volition use our ability to decide we will serve the lord so we know choice is part of what the will is about once you choose the lord and you say yes to him the spirit person in us the holy spirit then dwells in there and brings life to the original divine intention of god the original divine ed the original divine purpose now has Christ living there through the Holy Spirit. Now a shaft of light has come into my life. Now there comes this eternal spark and understanding that everything that I do now has a God implication to it, has a purpose, has something much greater and higher, something that's lasting beyond even my lifetime. We know the Bible tells us that these are different parts. First of all, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and then Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword dividing between 
soul and spirit. So we know there is a difference between the soul and the spirit. They're not the same thing. But they are so intertwined, especially when the spirit man comes to life, that they're inseparable except through the word of God. Now the Holy Spirit begins his influence, begins to work through us, the Spirit of God, to influence our thoughts so that our will would follow God. Now there are times when the Lord appeals to our emotions, but generally that is in response to knowledge that we have. And then our will comes into line with those feelings that either cause us to move or to fly away or get out of trouble or whatever it is we're doing but um j just to further emphasize the difference between spirit and soul because i'm going to run out of time today luke chapter 1 46 to 47 mary says uh, after the angel comes to her and talks about jesus being born my soul magnifies the lord my spirit rejoices in god my savior she distinguishes between soul and spirit my soul magnifies the lord and then my spirit rejoices. Two different, two different things are happening. The, the soul magnifies the Lord. In other words, her thoughts lift the Lord high because she is now, you know, she, she hears the word from the angel about having Jesus. Then she magnifies the Lord. So in her thinking, she lifts her thoughts about God higher. As she does that in her spirit, uh, the soul, or I mean, she does that in her soul, in her mind, her spirit part, then rejoices. Uh, this is the joy of the Lord is my strength, if you've ever heard that scripture. Galatians 5, 16, 17 says, To walk by the spirit and not after the flesh, for the flesh will condemn us. Let me read that one, because I think this is a, probably a good one to close on today. And I'll take this up again next week. Galatians 5, 16 Galatians 5.16, here in the last three or four minutes. Um, Galatians 5.16. 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. Which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that these who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So, the Bible is making a distinction that you can either follow flesh, which is the natural world, which would be my body, which is a source of uh, feelings and information. I have an eye gate, an ear gate, a nose gate, a sensory gate, a feeling gate, touch. These senses, I get information in. I can just follow that. That basic, base, natural, if it makes me feel happy, if I tingle, if I feel a good goose bump, if it brings me exhilaration in, the natural, in this natural body, then, hey, that's the way I'm going to follow. But the Bible says if you follow after that, you're following the works of the flesh, which end up being opposed to the works of the Spirit. Uh, when Adam and Eve fell, they took away our capacity to know what the works of the Spirit are until our mind is renewed, until it's conditioned. We're no longer born in the state of perfection. We're moving toward the state of perfection, which is the Spirit becoming dominant in our existence till the day we finally pass and we live in that spiritual realm. A lot of things I'm covering here in a in a quick hurry, but um, we walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. They are contrary to one another. So my soul's in the middle. My mind, which are my thoughts, 
my emotions and my will. I always say mind, will, emotions, because that's how I think they're supposed to work. I think the mind has to start the process. The will follows, and then the emotions respond to that. We have it backwards. Most times we operate from emotions to our mind, uh, and then we uh, try to get our thoughts around, wrapped around how we're feeling. But when I know the truth, the truth shall set me free, and the truth will reveal to me why I feel what I feel. So I got to go on that. <laughs> so next week, I'm going to talk more about the process of getting your soul strengthened and encouraged by your spirit so that your emotions now become servant to your life and not master. That's the beginning of victory. That's the beginning of maturity. It's the beginning of walking uh, in an understanding of divine purpose and destiny so that you can fulfill what God has in your life and not be crippled and hampered by a constant emotional engine that's trying to drive your life. We want a spiritual engine driving our life. The emotional thing is coming along as part of the ride, but we don't want it to be the primary driver of our life, right? So I don't know where you're at in anxiety, fear, emotions, and all of that, but I believe if you'll follow through and listen to some of these teachings for the next few weeks, I'm going to develop these a little bit more uh, to help us get some practical applications. One of the things that we do is we make faith and our walk with God mystical, so mystical that uh, it's not apprehend apprehendable. Uh, it's uh, happenstance if you happen upon it. Well, it's just mystical. It's kind of like uh, I heard a sermon many years ago, Gospel Casino. It's like roll the dice and maybe the good luck of God will touch my life. That's how we make spiritual things, like luck. But spiritual things, God's no respecter of persons. And if one thing works for me out of the Scriptures, it will work for you. If it worked for Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, if it worked for Peter, Paul, uh, James and John, it will work for you because God does not favor them over you. He's no respecter of persons in that way. And so he gives his principles to us. We can choose to follow them and live in the blessing or choose to follow the curse. I'm choosing every day to walk after the spirit. Do I sometimes let my flesh decide? Yeah, if I'm not being diligent about it, I mean, you're going to learn with me that this is a daily diet, daily habit that has to become a part of your life. Well, I believe God has great victory for you in every area of your life. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Don't let the clamor and chatter of this world cause you to live in fear, doubt, and unbelief. Find your place in Jesus Christ. Get that word. Get in church. Come back to God. Um, stop watching CNN, Fox and every other news network, start getting your nose in that Bible. Get your face before God. Pray. Seek His face. Ask the Lord to create in you a new heart and a new spirit that you might walk uprightly before Him. The psalmist said, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. This is what we're talking about, the heart and the spirit. We want God to create in us a clean heart which is our mind, will, and emotions, and creating us a right spirit, the spirit of God ruling and reigning in our life. You have the victory, even over your emotions, even over any disease and sickness. Father, in the name of Jesus, give us the victory tonight and always as we walk in faith in you and believing you for the victory and that you may be glorified in all of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, don't miss Victorious Living Church this week. If you're in the area here, we'd love to have you at 2996 Columbus Street. It is Grad Sunday. We're going to celebrate about a 10 to 12 graduates, I think, this year. Uh, Pastor Tammy and myself, our son, Will, is graduating. Uh, Will is uh, 18 and a half. We'll be graduating from Taze Valley High School this year and heading into the U.S. Army Reserve. So we're thankful for our son, who will be graduating this year, along with many other of our children of the church here, people that have grown up here, young people that now are moving into adulthood. It's a generational shift. And we'd love to have you here Sunday. I know Pastor Brent has a great word for the church. The worship will be powerful. The Holy Spirit will be here to move and to touch you. And we'd love to see you here this Sunday. 
If you can't make it, join us, 945 Live Pastor Ed Sunday morning, and then 1045 service uh, online live streamed on YouTube at Grove, let's see, YouTube Victorious Living Church GC, uh, and on Facebook as well at our Victorious Living Church Facebook page. I love you. God bless you. I pray for you often. Keep us in prayer as we touch the world with the overcoming message of Jesus Christ. Want to know more? Find us at vlcc.tv. God bless you.